I remember the first week my charge nurse said, can you go up to the toilets there and just check on that patient? And I went up and the next minute he had me by the neck and he was trying to strangle me and it was fight or flight. How and why did you decide to start a career in uh, mental health? I'd left school with no qualifications and I just took a part-time job uh, at a cash and carry store. I remember a chap coming up with his family uh, to look at a radio and I, I went up onto the ladder to get this radio down and uh, just as I came down, the chap collapsed and banged his head on the glass cabinet and unknown to me, he'd had, had a heart attack um, and he had died right out. And I thought throughout that for, for quite a few months after, um, I felt that I could have done something. And it was my uh, manager who was a ex-retired mental health nurse who said to me, Paul, it's, it's really playing you up, you know. Um, why don't you go down the route of nursing? And uh, it was a hospital called St. Lawrence's in Bodmin, Cornwall. And I applied for this job. I didn't tell my family because they probably thought, oh my gosh, because I was a bit of a rebel in the family. Um, and I went for the interview and a couple of days later, I received this letter to say that I'd been accepted as a nursing assistant. As I went in on my first day, uh, I really grew up. It really made me think, oh my gosh, this is a different world altogether. And they put me on a ward that was extremely busy. Um, it was an admission ward uh, where patients came in and they were assessed. Um, but eventually I worked on most wards in St. Lawrence's. What kind of illnesses were you dealing with at St. Lawrence? The kind of illnesses patients had were um, schizophrenia, uh, manic depressive, um, uh, depression, OCD, anxiety, and of course, not forgetting, uh, back then, you know, some 40 years ago, you would have what they called back then uh, by the layperson as a, a village idiot who maybe has gone out and smashed up a telephone kiosk and has, has become a bit of a problem in the community, they were actually sent to St. Lawrence's and they'd been there for a long time. You were very young when you started. How did it feel to be there surrounded by people with this quite severe mental health issues? It was quite harrowing, to be honest with you. I remember the first week my charge nurse said, can you go up to the toilets there and just check on that patient? And I went up and the next minute he had me by the neck and we had white coats on um, and he was trying to strangle me and it was fight or flight, you know. I, it really shook me up and I came out and I thought, well, one thing here, don't leave yourself, you know, don't become complacent. There was a lot of violence. I mean, it didn't happen every day, but you got to realise that, you know, on each ward with that, that, that volume of patients um, living under one roof, there would be tension and of course the illnesses and if somebody's paranoid or delusional, there, there are cases where um, they think you're, that you're after them, you're going to attack them, so they would attack you first. And I remember talking to a patient who I had a good therapeutic relationship with and uh, he, this, he just stared at me and I thought, this is, something's going on here. And I said to him, are you okay? No, he said, uh, the, the voices are telling me to kill you. And it was so real to him, you know. You have to be a certain person to go into nursing. And those that aren't the certain people, they stand out, you know. And I, and I, I often had that as a ward manager, recruiting staff. You could just tell the, the you know, if somebody's empathetic and uh, they're a caring person. And there's a, there's a line, you know, you've got to be, You've got to be strong and you've got to, you know, there's, there's boundaries with patients, etc. Um, but it's all a skill. All these are skills you learn over time, you know, and, and when you leave your shift, it's about leaving it all behind and not taking it home. When did you make a decision to move to a Broadmoor Hospital and why did you do that? 
Um, on my last ward at St. Lawrence's Hospital, uh, we had a lot of patients who had been at Broadmoor Hospital for some, I mean, back then, people who were there for 30, 40 years, some were there for life. I thought, well, you can't go any higher than this. You know, I've worked in a few hospitals, but this is the hospital where patients can't be managed anywhere else. That's why they go to high secure hospitals. So basically Broughtmoor is the place where a lot of criminals are held just because they otherwise pre present a threat to society and, thing, and they need constant psychiatric support, is that right? Well that is correct, but um, not all of them. I mean, what you get is you get, um, say somebody was sentenced to prison for 10, 15 years. If they had a relapse, if they had any mental health issues and they were category A, etc., they would come to a high secure hospital, whether that's Broadmoor, Rampton, Ashworth, etc. And there they would be treated under that security with medication. Once they uh, became well, they would transfer back to prison. So it's hopping from one to the other. And some people just continue to do that, you know, people who have been sentenced to life. What kind of criminals did you meet at Broadmoor? Well, I mean, you know, everybody knows who's who's been at Broadmoor and who was there, but, um, you know, it's, it's the usual Ronnie Cray and Peter Sutcliffe. There's quite a few of them, which you what you would call the infamous patients of uh, Broadmoor. But I have to say, if I give you an example, you know, we had one patient um, who was filming. He, he was in a lot of soaps, etc., with no names given. And he went off set, he became quite psychotic and he went off and um, he killed somebody uh, out on the street. And he was sentenced to Broad War. And I remember all the work we did with that chap. And then there's some coverage that came up about five years later in one of the, the tabloids. And um, you could just see how he deteriorated through that coverage. It was just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's ha this is having a real effect on him, you know? There was quite a lot of examples of different um, criminals that were in psychiatric hospitals who created a lot of art, yeah. like Charlie Bronson or Ronnie yeah, Cray. Yeah. I think that's the, 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 the only means at that time that they can get through to people, especially the staff, you know. I know a lot of psychologists have said art is the uh, huge theme when it comes to breaking down those barriers with a patient and building that trust. Uh, that's why an art therapist is so paramount on a unit. And it's about somebody who's, who, if I give you an example, is, is quite depressed and they won't speak. You know, there's no communication going on. Um, they'll do it in their picture. They draw something and you can ask, you can go in depth with it. You know, what, what does this mean? What, what, you put this here, what, what does that mean? What was the security like and what was the training like? You're, you're trained to use um, what was called control and restraint back then. Uh, and that, I believe, came from British Airways at the very beginning because of pa passengers on flights who were becoming problematic. And that, that carried over and the high secure hospitals did that first. So you are trained in that. And so if somebody um, attacked you, you have those, those uh, different holds that you put on, etc. cetera. And it's all, to, it's all because it's safe. You know, it's, nobody gets hurt. And then I went on to do the shield training. So that's like what the prisons do. So if somebody did have a weapon, you would bring the shields out and um, restrain somebody with the shields. It's, that was very interesting. Because nobody likes violence, nobody wants violence. And somebody who's unwell, who doesn't realize that they're doing these things, it's about making it safe, you, you know, because people many, many years ago have actually died through restraints. You've always got to think a couple of steps ahead. You would never go in a room first, a patient's room. You would always have somebody with you. You would never leave yourself in a corner. Um, there's been times, and I know there were two patients uh, one morning fighting in the day room, and the alarm bells went and everybody came in, and I actually ended up on the patient's, holding the patient's head. This is all through your techniques that you were taught. And we went into the seclusion room, and the seclusion room's used at the last resort. It's about bringing somebody down who's maybe gone from 0 to 10 in an arousal state with aggression. 
And um, I remember holding the head and you always numbered everybody. You wouldn't call them the staff their names because you might have somebody with the same names. And I said, number one, leave the room. And they went out the room and I had the head and we turned them around. So I had the legs then. Number two, leave the room. Uh, and just as I was about to, you know, spring backwards to be caught by the staff, the door closed. And for whatever reason, nobody really forgot this there, that um, they thought I'd actually got out. I was out of the room. And they shut the door. And of course, there's the patient who jumped up off the bed. And to me, all I could think of is like, hostage, you're now a hostage. Now it was, it seemed like forever, but it wasn't. It was maybe 10, 15 seconds, but that was enough to make me think, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah. How did you manage to get out of that one? Um, that one there, I actually, they pulled me out and they went back in and restrained the patient again and they all came out. And um, I think the staff just couldn't believe it, but it's still talked about today, you know. It's one of those incidents, which I've seen a few and been involved in, that always stayed with me, you know, because we had hostage training as well. And when you go deep into that, it's, um, it can be quite scary. What would be the most disturbing things you witnessed at Broadmoor Hospital, you think? Cutting, when somebody's cut their throat. That's, I mean, it doesn't have to be Broadmoor, it can be a, any other hospital, but that's quite something, you know, you deal with it, but it's, it's something, and obviously when somebody's um, hung themselves, that's, that's quite, uh, especially when, when you've got somebody so young, I've come across a few that have been very young and you just think it makes you feel how lucky you are when you leave a shift, you know? When you've got somebody talking to you and smiling and having a, a good joke, there's no, there's no indication that you're, they're gonna go and do something. You know, usually you can see triggers with somebody. You see triggers like their hands or the way they're looking. You know that patient inside out, really. Um, but when somebody doesn't do that and they're happy-go-lucky and then five minutes later they're, they've, they've got a sheet around their neck, you think, well, there's no indication there. You wouldn't have put that person on observations because they didn't need them, you know. Um, and what I learned through my career uh, with hangings, etc., is that if they're going to do it, they'll do it. They really will, whether it's in the hospital or the grounds, they'll do it. But there's been lots of things throughout the career where you thought, oh my gosh, you know, um, you just wouldn't see that anywhere else, you know. And then you go, you'd finish your shift after a horrific shift. I mean, not every day is like that. And you go into the supermarket and you'd have a, a young lady going, afternoon, how was your day? You know, you think, oh, if only you knew. And you do have a bit of guilt. You think all the time, all the all the input we've given that person and you, you feel like you've, you've let them down. You know? Have it ever happened to anyone who you were kind of connected to? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're especially at Broadmoor, when you're um, nursing there, you are given so many patients to look after. So that would be care plans, um, reviews. You, you're their named nurse, so you do build up that rapport. They call it unconditional positive regard, where you've got to put everything to one side. And I'll give you an example of that. If you know a patient's being transferred up to you and you have read the notes, that can have an effect before the person's walked on the unit. If you haven't read the notes and you build a rapport and read them later, you seem to have that connection, more of a connection. It's all those different things like Silence is the most powerful thing where some people would be so uncomfortable with it. That's a time for reflection, for the person to think about what you've said or for me as well. It's about um, all the different things you would ask and what you wouldn't ask. I mean, you, you have to challenge some patients, but you wouldn't just go in on your own and challenge them, whatever it may be. You'd make sure that you had support with you. What do you say you liked most about your job? There was lots of funny things over time, you know, and you've got to have that sense of humour. And I have to say, the patients would have a real laugh with you as well, you know? And that's what it was all about. But the chap who 
went running to the toilet and I said, are you all right? Oh, he said, I've got the, the runs. And he went off to the toilet. I thought, you've been gone a while. So um, I went up to the toilet and I shouted the, the chap's name. We just call him Joe. I said, Joe, are you all right? He said, well, no. He said, the doctors have given me some salt and that's not working out very well. And I said, salt? What do you mean, salt? Well, he said, I went to the ward round and instead of prescribing me medication, he said, just take some salts. So when I, he, I said, open the door a minute. So he opened the door, of course, there's feces all over the walls and that. And I said, what kind of salts did you take? He said, summer salts. And I thought that was really, you know, from somebody who's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why did you make a decision to leave your career as psychiatric nurse? Um, through 35 years, I could retire and uh, I had a good pension and a lump sum and I thought it was time to go, but I didn't leave mental health. I left as a ward manager, I retired, got my 35 years and continued to work voluntary um, in lots of organisations. I've always been linked. Uh, to, to, to mental health always, you know, and by going around doing surveys around the United Kingdom, meeting so many different people and, you know, it's, it's fantastic, yeah. Do you miss being at the, at the hospital? Sometimes I do. When I go and visit units and um, support staff, uh, it, it takes you all back being on the, the units and patients will always come up to you not even knowing you. And they'll, they'll say, oh, hello, Paul, pleased to meet you and all that. And you can tell you're a nurse, you know, it's, it's quite amazing, really. But you never lose those skills. You, you can build, you know, you can have that rapport right away. You can converse. And that's the biggest thing in nursing is getting through to somebody. But I always see it as a privilege to work somewhere like that. Absolute privilege. You know, if you can just change somebody a little bit like that each day, that's good enough for me because you can't expect everything, you know, people don't get well over, overnight. But if you can make that little bit of happiness um, and, and uh, make their day worthwhile, that, that's good for me and that's why I was in the job. Yeah, he said, you know, he said, um, you know, um, you're, you're really unwell and um, you've got this this diagnosis, schizoaffective disorder. I kind of thought my life was over as soon as I got that diagnosis.